Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my background and, uh, and we'll, we'll keep it all things technical. So I, uh, I'm, I'm born and bred in Alberta, Canada, uh, a, a local farm boy. So my mom was a farmer and my, my dad was a, a cattle buyer or a banker turned cattle buyer. Nice. And when I was 16, I absolutely fell in love with the veterinary industry. Uh, I didn't consider myself much of an academic, but uh, this girl on, on my school bus, she said, you know what, I think you would really like a volunteer work experience at the local vet clinic that she had done. So I, uh, I, I walked into the vet clinic I was going to do half days for a semester and literally from the first second that I walked into that vet clinic, I fell in love with the profession. I loved everything about it, but I think what I loved most was the chaos. I loved, <laughs> I loved walking into that vet clinic and never knowing what to expect. And, and I remember every, every day after lunch, my first block, so my third block in high school was my English class and I was late every single day. And I would walk in and I was dripping placenta and I had iodine stained on my hands and my clothes. And I remember my English professor, she would always stop the class and she would say, okay, Cody, tell us your story. And then I would get to recount the, uh, the, the day that, that I had with the veterinarian and semen testing bulls and, uh, and popping abscesses and pushing in uterine prolapses and, and, uh, you know, dealing with a dog who, who had been constipated because it ate too much moose meat, which is a real, a real problem uh, from, from the north where I'm from. You'll actually get dogs constipated with moose meat. And I just loved every aspect of it. And, and I've, I've chased that, that feeling and that dream ever since. So I uh, graduated from vet school in 2011. And I uh, went into a beef cattle specific practice at the time. It, it was a difficult decision for me because I, I loved every aspect of vet med. I loved, I loved small animal. I loved small animal orthopedics. And I loved cat medicine. I loved every part of it. But there was a great opportunity in this practice uh, in, in Calgary, north of Calgary, with this with this beef cattle um, specialty sort of sort of group. Uh, that was kind of my my start into where I ended up today in that I was trying to make my mark on the practice. So I thought that I would really slingshot us into the 21st century by getting us a website. So this was 2000, now 2012, and this vet clinic still didn't even have a website. So very, very old school, right? There was, there was no, I remember Googling them when I was in vet school, uh, getting ready for my interview, learning everything I possibly could so I could really nail that interview. And there was, there was one mention of this practice on the whole of the internets. So that's where I started. I started uh, thinking, okay, we need to get ourselves a website. And it was really just serendipitous, uh, the, the programmer, uh, for that website, he 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 programmed it. He he was from Holland originally, kind of a, a serial entrepreneur, a techie type guy, and he started teaching me about the power of the internet and and the power of digital storytelling. How do you leverage Twitter? How do you leverage Instagram? How do you leverage video content creation? And I was able to grow a practice on the backbone of that to, to a really nth degree and created a ton of opportunities on the back of, of, uh, of the internet. And talking to the veterinary industry about that, you know, I, I started speaking quite early in, in this path. So I've, I've, I've done public speaking everywhere, um, all across North America, talking to veterinary groups about, about my story of, you know, growing to hundreds of thousands of followers on, on uh, Facebook and YouTube and Instagram. And sometimes it feels like I'm talking to a wall, right? It just, it doesn't always resonate in terms of, of, of how that context could potentially help veterinary clinics grow and how it's, um, it's, digital storytelling is such a foundation to be able to, to, to market your vet clinic. And the, and the best part of it is it's relatively cheap. It's, it's sweat equity, right? You point a camera towards your face and you talk about your day as a veterinarian and people love it. So that, that was the, you know, that was the genesis and the start of, of everything that, that went from there. Nice. Well, I grew up raising Herefords. Oh, wonderful. 
<laughs> so, so I, no. I will hold. I will hold no judgment against you. I, I'll still think you're a pretty decent guy. <laughs> yeah, my my early job as a kid was always checking the electric fence after a storm. <laughs> And I, I swear that's why I dislocate my shoulders so easily. It's just from jolting them out every storm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, it's a good wholesome childhood to be raised with, with cows around. That's my theory. They're really sweet animals. And uh, even when they do escape in the storms and you have to chase them through miles of cornfields. But I do think they're a really special, underappreciated animal. Yeah, and the, the you know the rancher, the the farmer, uh, as well. In terms of you know, we were. I, I like to talk about how veterinarians are are super passionate about what we do, right? You you're not gonna find. I don't think you're gonna find as many dentists out there in the world as passionate about pulling teeth as veterinarians are about being veterinarians. Uh, but ranchers. Uh, cattle ranchers specifically, I think, are in, in another level because they are 100% willing to work every day for, for literally no pay, that they are so passionate. And, and I, I always do this analogy to a pig farmer. You never see that same sort of glint in a pig farmer's eye when he looks across his, his uh, barn full of sows as you do as the cattle rancher looking across at his field of cows. They, uh, they are truly a, a, a very passionate industry. It's interesting you notice that our, one of our neighbors growing up had 10,000 pigs and um, they were noticeable in the summer, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Well, great. So that's interesting background. So I love the, I, I'm not sure that my high school English teacher would have been appreciative of the, uh, of the intrusion, but uh, <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, the small town, yeah, the, the benefits of growing up in a small town, I think. Indeed. So great. Well, I, I love that story. That's fantastic. Uh, for, for me, I grew up on a small farm. And uh, both my parents were artists and I grew up as the black sheep in the family because I knew from a small kid, as a small kid, I wanted to be an engineer and was just kind of, that's what I did. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, besides obviously needing to deal with the cows and the chickens and everything else that I had to deal with as a, as a kid, uh, very early on, got involved with computers and this was back before they were easy to find and uh, you know, learned some of my early computer experiences were on uh, mainframes with punch cards and, and all of that good stuff. I used to have to bike, you know, it was before I could drive. So I used to bike to the local school that had a mainframe and they would let me come in to the air conditioned room and do my stuff. This is the this is the Genesis story of of Bezos and Gates, right? <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. So you know, same generation, and and you really kind of had to work if you wanted to do these things. And it was very you know, very different. Um, boy, I learned so many different languages as a as a kid because it was it was way stranger languages back then, like APL, which you had to have a Greek keyboard for, and was designed for math and uh, COBOL, which, which was not that much fun, but we did on punch cards. And, and I shut down payroll for the whole uh, school system one weekend because I, I left out a little card as I was calculating uh, prime numbers. And <laughs> so no teacher got paid, but I got a lot of prime numbers in. <laughs> so that, those were kind of my early days, but um, Went from there to doing a lot of different startups and kind of entrepreneur early, early on, but also worked at the big companies. So had the pleasure of working at Microsoft in the 80s and uh, working at Borland during their heyday, writing, you know, working on language products and working at Amazon a while ago when it was... Uh, much smaller and, and crazier, but still super intense place there and fascinating company. So had a lot of, 
lot of great experiences that we're trying just, to pull into the veterinary world. Uh, about a month ago, I finished reading the Everything Store, the book, the Everything Store about the the genesis of Amazon. It was fascinating. Huh, I haven't read that. I'll have to put it on my list because I probably know a ton of the people. And I have to say, it's a company that I admire greatly because. A lot of companies, a lot of, a lot of organizations as they grow larger tend to self-replicate. So, you know, they, they justify growing larger and larger because they have a mission to grow larger and larger instead of growing larger and larger because of something a customer needs. And Bezos has managed to keep the Amazon culture very focused and very tight. And you know, I talked to my friends there who are now running at the time running, I don't know, $100 million divisions, billion dollar divisions, and now it's 10, 20, $150 billion divisions that they're running, but they still have that maniacal focus on customer and maniacal focus on data. And I think it's just, it's fascinating that he's managed to do that, 500,000 employees, but you can still, you still talk to somebody who's an executive there and I sent, I sent a friend of mine who runs an enormous division, a screenshot of a search result that was wrong. And you know, one, one minute later, we're sorry about that. I put in a ticket, you know, 10 minutes later, we know what the root cause is, it's gonna be addressed tomorrow. And you just don't find that. I mean, imagine calling up Ford and saying, hey guys, uh, I just wanna let you know the steering wheel's a little bit loose, right? And, and, and a senior vice president of the entire division calls you back five minutes later and says, Wow, we're, we're really upset about that. We found exactly what in our manufacturing process led to that. We're retooling the plant tomorrow. We're going to have it fixed. Don't worry. No one will ever have this problem again. You just don't see it. But Amazon's done that. And I just think it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. The, so so uh, one, of my, one of my guilty pleasures is, is learning about a lot of these different types of businesses. And I, I, I have a slight obsession with the Genesis story of, of businesses in general. So whether that be the Mars Candy Bar Corporation or Ford or Airbnb or LinkedIn or Facebook, um, but, but always, with, always with this lens of the veterinary industry because I, I love the concept of overall disruption. I, you know, I, I believe in the prime tenant that, that all industries become disrupted at some point. And I don't feel like the veterinary industry has been truly disrupted. So when I look at a company like Amazon, I always look at it with the lens of a, of a veterinarian or the, the veterinary industry to see if there's any lessons learned that can be applied. One of my most kind of recent things that, that I love thinking about just as a thought experiment was, was thinking about Airbnb and how they started uh, with this, uh, with their, their, I guess, I don't know what, what the official theory is, but uh, basically what is a five-star experience? What is a six-star experience? What is a seven-star experience? On and on into 11-star experience. So what is the, what would the craziest 11-star veterinary clinic experience look like? And then scale that back to how could we provide as an industry a seven-star experience at a five-star price, right? Because we know within the veterinary industry, what a five-star experience looks like. And then unfortunately, the low, the bar is quite low, right? You walk into a veterinary clinic, it's kind of dumpy, it kind of smells. Uh, you're in the waiting room for 10, 15 minutes. You go to, to into the exam room. The vet doesn't make you feel like an idiot. Uh, your fears are alleviated. Your pet is, is given a prescription or, or diagnostics or treatment. The staff communicates well with you. Uh, you have a seamless checkout experience. And that's a five-star experience. And that's kind of a sad five-star experience, right? So, so what would it look like if you had a six-star experience within a veterinary clinic or a seven-star experience or, or an eight-star experience? You know, those are the types of like lessons learned that I love thinking about because that's, you know, that's what, what Airbnb was, was founded on is, is how do we provide more than just giving you a room for the night? How do we, how do we design an experience around the entire process. And I think uh, your questions are pretty interesting. We also like to think about, at least at Rhapsody, is how do we make the veterinarian's day 
go from a three star experience to a five star to a seven star because that's also going to reflect back to the client. And if the veterinarian is dealing with endless frustrations of trying just to get their practice to operate where they're flying blind, they don't know what, they don't know how the business is working, they don't know what patients are there, they don't know what they're supposed to do, and they're madly. They're, they're madly hoping that the, the cryptic note they wrote on the yellow sticky is going to result in the correct med being given to the correct patient. Then they're also having a day that's it's going to make it very hard for the client to get the seven star experience. And so I think part of the key to, to solving that question that you pose is to make sure that the entire system is functional. And if you go back to look at Amazon, uh, how does Amazon deliver that amazing experience to clients? of, you know, when the package is coming, you know, it's the right order, you know, how to, everything you know is, is right there is they've invested incredibly in backend systems. And, and that's something that in the veterinary industry historically hasn't been there. And, and part of what got me excited about going into the veterinary space is I looked at the, the types of systems that I used when I was running huge businesses and the types of reporting and the types of analytics and the types of just kind of control mechanisms and looked at the software in the veterinary space and said, good grief, there's such a difference there. So what if we take some of those things and apply it to the veterinary world? So uh, for example, can you imagine a world at Amazon where uh, Harry Potter books all had different names and one of them's called Potter Harry, and one of them's called Harry Potter, and one of them's by J.K. Roll. Uh, all, all proper, but it's just, you know, three different editors type in the names differently, and everybody said, whatever, Harry Potter, Harry Pitter, it's all the same. Well, that's kind of the veterinary space, right? You've got five names for everything, and no one can spell them. <laughs> And, and you look at a drug prescription and, you know, say something where, you know, there's a lot of the flea meds have a color and they've got a weight and you'll see a prescription and it's got a color and a weight, but they're not the right combination. It's like, well, did I just give the, the chihuahua the elephant flea <laughs> dose or did I give the elephant the chihuahua dose? And, and so you look at all this stuff. So there's just, you can't run an organization efficiently that way. You can't run, especially if you're a group of practices where you want to know, you know, what's my pricing structure? What's my production like? What do I have particular vets or particular techs or rock stars? How can I help recognize those rock stars and make them even bigger rock stars? Well, if you get your data right and you get interesting, clean, analyzable data, you can start to unlock all of this stuff. And and so I looked at that and thought, wow, we could really make an interesting difference in this industry. Yeah, you're you're 100 percent right. I, you know, I when I came into practice, we're talking about within this decade, right? So, so I, I still have not been out in, in for 10 years. And when I came to my practice, all the calls were in a in a paper book. Like mm -hmm. it was, you had to drive to the office to see what you had booked for the next day in order for you to be prepared and do your reading. Within this decade, that was how a veterinary clinic was operating. No mm -hmm. website, no integration, not, nothing at all. And in, in, in that space, you know, I was looking for a, a few different options because I was also working with the cattle industry, right? And, and the same thing exists within the cattle industry. The, the level of, of, uh, of te technological solutions that exist are, are, are just not there. So then I was left within my practice patching together uh, not what the you know, veterinary software industry had to offer because I, I was not satisfied at all of, of any of the solutions. So then I'm patching together, you know, things like G Suite and Slack and, and just trying to, to make it all work. And, and it, it's good options, right? Like it, it's, it's better than what a lot of the software um, is in, within the veterinary industry. And that's now as, as what I'm doing in, in doing a, a new set of veterinary clinic startups is when I'm looking for, for partners, that's exactly what I'm looking for is I want, I want to work with a company that actually feels like it was programmed, you know, the software was programmed 
in, in the year 2020, because <laughs> that's the first thing I say whenever I, you know, whenever I'm, I'm talking to a, to a software company uh, for, for my startups is I don't, I can't work with a software that feels like it was programmed in 1989 and it feels like that I'm, I'm, I got to start up DOS before I can start my medical records. Like it's, it, it's ludicrous how, how antiquated some of our tools are still right now that are, that are viewed as like the gold standard tools. It's, it's great. They, they are. And so part of what we do, uh, well, before I talk about what we do, but amusingly, when I first started in the vet space, I went to, uh, VMX to get a feel of is this a is this a space I'm interested in and I came away so excited about this space for a variety of reasons um, and one of the reasons was when I looked at the dominant software in the marketplace uh, I looked at the screen it's like you know uh, 30 years ago I was running the software product these things were written on and they're using the same icons yes <laughs> I know like so it was, it was, you know, it's like this instant nostalgia and I'm like, okay, where's my Duran Duran eight track? Let's get going. But, um, but that's just opportunity. And, and as we look at, you know, so, so part of what we do is we've written software to migrate from most of these legacy systems. And one of the interesting things that happens when you write such software is you see the world from the back end perspective of these other products. And it just, sometimes I, I write my engineers, I say, gosh, I, I so much appreciate what we've built when I'm looking at, you know, look, looking at data coming from these systems and it's a measure of, let's say, heart rate. And the person puts in pink because it's just really a notepad. Like in our system, you can't put in pink for a heart rate. You can as a comment, if you're feeling, you know, synesthetic or whatever, but, <laughs> but heart rate, we make it be a heart rate and all of the other kind of MMC, we make it be an MMC result. And so we're trying to guide people to having clean, repeatable, clickable processes and get away from that right on the sticky note and hope somebody can read it uh, instead to is you doing your soaps? Click through. Here's, here's all of the different conditions that you might find. Oh, it's a equine. Great. Here's your equine findings. Let's go in. Oh, you have some otitis. Perfect. Which ear? And what's it, what's it smell like? What's it look like? All pre there so that you're practicing better medicine. Uh, not that doctors don't practice good medicine, but let's just make it easier. Yeah. Let's just make it so that you, you don't have to do as much thinking and you can just fly through and focus much more on, let's say, the, the diagnostic side, asking questions to the client about what led to this condition, which is, can be so interesting in medicine or, or for the places that are fast, just, just be able to get higher throughput and spend, you know, if, if we can keep a veterinarian from staying up all night typing in notes for what they did in the day, because it's so fast to get them in real time, then the medicine's gonna be better, the doctor's life is gonna be better, the efficiency of the clinic is gonna be better, and uh, everybody wins. Absolutely. In, um, in 2015, uh, I, I was part of a, a, a new business where we were uh, acquiring mixed animal practices across uh, Western Canada. So we, we purchased five, uh, we purchased five vet clinics from, you know, very remote rural areas to more central, central areas that, that were a little bit larger towns. And we inherited the, uh, the vast majority of, of different software solutions, right? And, and we did integrate to, to, you know, a singular one, but I was always disheartened at, at the, the user experience that my veterinarians had you know, some of my veterinarians would be two weeks behind in their medical records, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it, it's just bad for business. It, you, the, 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 if you, I, I know, I know, you know, the data, but if, if you don't complete your medical record within 12 hours, then the percentage of charges that you lose, is huge, right? If, if exactly. One day pays for, pays for a, a good software solution. It is, it is ludicrous. And I, and I, you know, I started thinking about, 
how do you how do you shoehorn this? How do you how do you provide solutions to these veterinarians with the existing software solutions at that time? You know, I was thinking about crazy things like uh, maybe each veterinarian should be assigned a, a, a virtual a virtual assistant that is listening in on every call like a spy movie. You know how how James Bond has the has the assistant in his ear who who can see all things and is like a hacker in the background opening doors and gates and stuff like that. Maybe that's what the veterinarian needs i don't know of, of somebody who's typing medical records for them in real time just so they can stay caught up but but there sh it shouldn't have to be that way you should be able to to seamlessly integrate uh your your medical record which is a fairly basic thing into that customer experience and not detract from that as well you know that's another great uh part of of that experience is you know you want your vet to be engaged in that 15 minute conversation but also finish their work in that 15 minute conversation as well so exactly so how do we how do we get there was 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 super important and i never came up with a great solution <laughs> yeah that's a lot of the kind of thought process that we've been putting into the software and of course it's hard it's a really tricky space uh veterinarians are um <laughs> each of them veterinarians have a lot of differences among them and they have their own styles and techniques and desires and uh, and a lot of them are so used to the legacy systems that sometimes it's this culture shock to think about the change that our software is is trying to offer uh, just because some you know, some people say well where's my shift alt control f12 key it's like well you don't need that anymore <laughs> But if you've spent 10 years of your life memorizing some of these keys, you know, you've got culture shock or you've, you've got, oh, I just clicked that, but, but where is this, where is that? And so people, it takes a little bit of getting used to. My theory though is, is people forget how challenging it was for their first month of learning whatever it is that they're used to. And after they get onto a new system, a month afterwards, it'll just, it starts to become second nature. Uh, but it is, uh, it's a challenging market. It's really interesting. It's interesting all of the different, you know, uh, my wife had said to me, well, you know, thank heavens you're not working in human medicine. That has to be more complicated. And, and I'm not really sure that it is because <laughs> we have to deal with, like humans, you have one stomach. But... <laughs> We have to deal with critters with one stomach or four stomachs. We have to deal with critters with one genital system or cloacal slits. We have to deal with things with so many different conditions and so many different, uh, so many different viruses and bacteria that need to be tested for. And, and obviously, you know, we, ha we have to be able to take all of those different animals and you know, even simple things like knowing that a rattlesnake vaccine is not a vaccine for a rattlesnake. <laughs> it's just, it's just so many fun and, and interesting twists to it. So in a way, I think we've got it. Uh, and, and the other part is in the human industry, it's all dominated by insurance codes. And right. that's another thing that we set out to do is to standardize everything. So you don't have uh, Dr. One putting in kennel cough and Dr. Two putting in CIRD and each has a completely different charge. You know, and then at the end of the, the day, like, hey, how much kennel cough are we seeing? Uh, not much. Life is good. But that CRD, man, we're seeing an awful lot of that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the opportunity that exists within that, you know, the, the true analytics space, the opportunity to, to layer on some machine learning into some of the stuff that we're doing to practice better medicine is huge. Yep. There, there's, there's nothing but, but huge potential there. It is a... Uh, uh, sometimes I, I almost pity individuals that for, are from the non-veterinary space that fall in love with the veterinary space because we're uh, veterinarians in general are, are sometimes very difficult to work with, right? We're, uh, we're super frugal. Uh, you'll probably never meet a cheaper group of, of individuals uh, that, that exist out there, but at the end of the day, we're also super passionate. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting mix of, of, um, of people. And of course, you know, the, the, 
the demographics as well, right? Uh, I believe that people who are investing within the veterinary industry are just at the precipice of something special because of how quickly our demographics are going to shift. I'm, I'm sure you know the age of the average practice owner that exists uh, across the U.S. and Canada. Uh, it's 63, so the, the, that average age uh, is going to change rapidly as we ha see this, this massive wave of practice owners moving into either succession or retirement and the decision makers will be the next generation that are hungry for something else because right now unfortunately uh, to adopt a new technology you, you rely on the decision maker the practice owner and and I if I'm 63 running a practice and somebody is talking to me about this newfangled vet software that I'm gonna have to take a month to learn I'm probably gonna be pretty grumpy about that but uh, but the, that next generation of practice owner, I believe, will be looking for every advantage that, that we can get. Exactly. And the next generation of practice owner grew up with Amazon and Uber and all of these things and doesn't want to have to discover the shift alt F10 key because it doesn't, you know, where, where's that key on this device? <laughs> so people want to be able to just work work from home, let's, let's imagine a global pandemic came up. Not that that would ever happen, but imagine a global pandemic came up and your appointment books are physically on paper in the office and y'all really don't want to have to drive into the office every day. You wanna be able to continue running most of your practice remotely if possible or parking lot style if possible. And there's just so many things that need to shift and. You know, even, even little things you don't think about like payment, we've got these Wi-Fi Bluetooth payment terminals that our software works with and you hold it outside the car window and the person, well, they wave their candy bar at the payment terminal and, and it works. And so stuff like that becomes, you know, really interesting as opposed to the old school stuff that starts to fail in these conditions. So the, there's just so much to do. And I'm also really interested in some of the companies that are, trying to help new veterinarians become entrepreneurs as well. So how can somebody who is early in their vet career become more of an owner of a clinic and be an owner operator rather than have that be a 10 year path. And uh, so some of the companies doing that, I think it's super interesting. How can we, how can we shift so many parts of the industry to make it, just to make it better. Like you said, how do we get to an 11 star? Yeah. And I, I love that you bring that up. So that is, that is another true passion of mine. Uh, I, I have a, a group called the seven summit society. Uh, it's a, it's a, a business that we started up in the last year, Dr. Dan Mark Walder, Adam Conroy, they're practice owners in the greater Chicago area. Uh, they own 18 uh, companion animal practices there. And Danielle Lambert, she's the founder of snout school. She is the, uh, the, the marketing genius of the veterinary industry and she has done so much uh, to, to empower uh, women within our industry. She has done so much to uh, empower uh, minorities within our industry. She's a, a fascinating individual and that's exactly what the gist of the Seven Summit Society is, is we just love mentoring veterinarians into practice ownership because there has never been a better time to invest in, in this industry as practice owners, there's so much opportunity. Uh, the ability to, to leverage technology, the, the ability for us to create brand, right? The ability for us to, to digital story tell and to create true brand within, you know, within the veterinary space. Uh, of course, we all know what's happening with corporate consolidation and I'm not a hater of corporate consolidation. It, it is what it is, right? It, it's a, a function of, of any mature industry that we're going to See, see what we see. But as an entrepreneur, it is the best thing in the world because it just allows you to, to go super niche. It allows you to create brand. It allows you to reinvest and to, to pivot quickly and to be innovative where your competitor is, is so much slower to be able to do that. Now they, you know, it, it is, it has never been better. Debt, Dr. Dan. So Dr. Dan is in a, a different generation than I am. So I love talking to him about the old days, you know, the early nineties of veterinary medicine. And he's like, you guys 
have no idea how amazing of a time it is. The ability for somebody to go out and do a new startup is, is unbelievable. You know, interest rates are low. The ability for you to, to leverage different technologies, the level of medicine you get to practice. He's like, in 1992, do you know like the level of medicine we were practicing? We were just kind of sitting around in our vet clinic doing the odd vaccination, maybe the odd spay and neuter, and, and, and that's it. He's like, you have the ability to access diagnostics. You have the ability to, to provide all of these amazing different programs to these pet owners. So it's, a, it, I, I love, you know, I, I love that that sentiment that that I, and I believe that too that the, the 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 future of the veterinary industry is going to see this wave of really robust entrepreneurs coming into the space uh, and there's no I, I'm so fortunate as an entrepreneur because there there is no better industry that I could think of that that gives you those types of opportunities it's it's great it is. It's, uh, it's ripe for disruption. And of course, disruption is a two-edged sword. There's always funny things that happen with it. But, but there's so many things that we can do. And there are so many interesting companies and players that can bring in new solutions and new technology to, to make this feasible and to, to drive decision-making in a different way, to drive ownership in a different way, to drive profitability better, to drive work-life balance better. All of these things are part of the same equation. We really can approach all of that. And, and at the end of the day, it gets back to making people's lives better. So if, if collectively we can help make veterinarians have better lives and be less exhausted and frustrated, uh, then that's fantastic. And if, if part of how we can do so is, you know, there's so much in technology that we can use to help with that. Um, some of which we do, some of which are more, more future and aspirational for us, but you know, just, just simple things like looking at reports that we have in the system of what percentage of revenue is coming from inventory versus service versus diagnostics. You should have that real time on your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And you look at that and that, that can help drive you to start to think, uh, do I need, how much should I be spending on bags of dog food sitting on the floor waiting to be peed on, right? Maybe, maybe given my revenue curves, I should shift that a little bit. Maybe take a look at uh, another part we do that I really love is we show what percentage of uh, what percentage of visits had what percentage of vitals checked? And then obviously this is a doctor by doctor, clinic by clinic issue, but, and clearly the big ones are always there, right? Like weight and, and heart rate and so forth are always there, but it's really interesting to see what percentage of veterinarians are looking at the fear and anxiety score. And how does that change doctor by doctor or clinic by clinic or region by region? And the data is just super interesting. How many questions do people ask during the diagnostic phase? How many different body systems are they looking at? I'm sure in vet school, they taught you need to look at everything and here's the order you should look at it and never skip step one, two, or three. Well, we can tell which steps are being skipped and, and what conditions are common. Um, you know, how, much, how much otitis is coming through? How much how many black cats are being seen in the region? All of these things become super interesting to look at. I think, the, I think just some of the things you start to get by being able to visualize the data starts to, A, it's, it's really interesting for the scientist part of the veterinarian, but B, as a practice owner, if you can see how you're, what's driving your business and what's driving your expenses, and then you can, you can start to make decisions that are gonna make sense. And, I, do, I just think there's so many things that we can drive to help, to help make life better. Oh yeah. Not, not only just as a practice owner, but as the, the marketer in me loves that I, I'm getting excited thinking about the opportunity to leverage that, that set of data in, in order to market what we're doing. Right. So if you're getting, yeah. if you're seeing this trend, I can in real time empower my marketing team to be able to, to create sets of content uh, in order to throw out to, to my hyper local community and, and, 
drive uh, drive conversion that way. It's it's a huge opportunity to be able to do that. Yeah, there's just it, it is um, it, it's been so underutilized for for so long. Uh, but the the opportunity and the upside is 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 huge. I, I I like that you brought up the dog food thing too. Uh, what a terrible design feature of our industry to think that in our waiting room we should line the walls with dog food. <laughs> uh, there's uh, so so right right now I'm a. And I'm, I'm doing a, so I divested out of all of my, my veterinary clinics over the past year. So I sold out of the mixed animal. I sold out of the, the cow vet uh, clinics and I just couldn't get, you know, I couldn't get the bug out of my system. And I saw all the opportunity within the companion animal world uh, in terms of the potential for disruption, right? I, I, I see it, it, you know, very stagnant in some of these geographies. So that's exactly what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm creating a platform as a clinic to be able to, to leverage all of the opportunity that exists but also on the backbone of this you know the spirit of entrepreneurship and mentorship so with the the ability to give opportunity to the next generation of veterinarians to mentor them within my practice not just to be great veterinarians but also great business owners to to be great mentors themselves and then partner with them you know in the in the next clinic and the next clinic and give them the opportunity to to be practice owners and and using technology I'll be able to to have a greater chance of success to be able to do that mm -hmm. yeah there's and there's so many things as well that we see and from the business side of how can vets be more successful and um, ton of opportunity there and and as you know it's a funny funny group of folks. Uh, but for example, we, for a number of clinics, we save them significant money with our software. But <laughs> sometimes people don't quite look at the, the money the way that a traditional business person would of, you know, $1,000 on the bottom line is really different than $1,000 on the top line because of margin and because of time and so many other things like so sometimes i feel like we're under marketing because we'll say oh well we're going to save you a thousand bucks a month well but that's also the same as driving in ten thousand dollars or more business a month maybe twelve thousand dollars or more business depending upon the margin structure and so for we we probably should market it differently and say hey look would you like to get an extra twelve thousand dollars of revenue a month rather than saying we'll save you a thousand bucks a month and in fact, I should write that, you know, like Rochelle, <laughs> Rochelle, you should think about that. <laughs> Just, you know, for me, being, being an entrepreneur and running large businesses for so long, I kind of have a built-in calculator for, for thinking about it that way. But, you know, but it's not like you get taught that in veterinary school. Uh, you don't get taught that in business school either. It's kind of, right. you, you learn this stuff from the school of hard knocks and from being an idiot for long enough and <laughs> the school of i have bills to pay <laughs> right exactly and and if you're lucky you run across somebody that wants to help people and mentor them and can kind of knock some sense into you and and if you're not lucky then you you fail and decide that didn't feel so good and, <laughs> and try to do it a different way so, well so one of one of my one of my concerns just within this, you know, the space of the, the, the technologies that we have as veterinarians uh, in order for us to be able to leverage is also the companies behind you know, those companies, right? So the companies behind the product, you know, we have, we're, we're talking about corporate consolidation. We're talk, talking about these large groups. And I think a lot of times people don't recognize uh, that, you know, how, big companies leverage your data in order to make decisions to actually compete against you. You know, there's that, that's a huge thing that that's coming up and I'm super sensitive to that. I, I, I understand that. So, you know, the ability for me to, to invest my, my data into a product that has the potential to then be marketed against me um, at, in doing the veterinary things that I'm trying to do, 
really, really frustrates me. And so I, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm looking through and I, I come across this, this great set of products, right? Um, but let's take, let's take genomics for an example. I come across this great genomic solution or a pet wearable. I think maybe pet wearable is even, even more exciting. So, so I come across this pet wearable technology. I'm like, wow. And I think about all the amazing opportunities that I have as a veterinarian to practice better medicine and as a practice owner in order to do things like drive compliance, which then mm -hmm. of course drives, drives revenue. So I'm like, this would be so amazing to be able to integrate this type of technology into my practice. And I start, start digging into it and I realize who the parent company is. And, I, and it starts clicking together, oh, of course they're investing in, into this technology because they see how that data can, can be leveraged within their own organization, but I can also see how that data can be eventually leveraged against me as the, as the, the solo entrepreneur out there uh, creating new vet clinics, right? It's, there, there's two parts of that. So I, I get more and more sensitive to that as there's, there's more of that within the, within the space. It's a really interesting issue. Uh, to me, having lived in a big data world for a while, uh, I tend to have a different, probably different perspective on it. Um, part of what I see is I see a lot of veterinarians with misplaced understanding of data security as one part. So we'll, we'll talk to a lot of clinics and like, well, how do I know that my data is secure? Because today it's all in paper files. Like paper files are the least secure thing you can possibly imagine, right? While, while you're in the back having a discussion with me, my handy assistant could be copying all of your data and you would never know. My handy assistant could shred half of your files and you would never know, right? So, so there's a different, different set. Now, having said that, most companies haven't had to deal with security the way that, you know, my team has coming from, <laughs> coming from the, the companies that we've had and the, the, you know, the attacks from foreign governments and so forth that we've had to deal with. So we have a little bit of different perspective there, but, but so first off, some of the security is misconstrued. Second part, when I look at it is you need data to run, to run a business in a future world. And so, in a way you need to figure out how to get used to it just because let's say that that wearable that's making a real difference that happens to have its data going to some large corporation but makes a real difference for the pet life and you decide no 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 i don't want to use it i'm going to stick with uh i'm going to stick with old school bring the pet in every 15 minutes and i'm going to take out my stethoscope right versus the person who's got a 24 seven harness that's monitoring heart rate well you're just going to lose and so you need to be able to figure out how to deal in that world in which people are moving to the 24 7 harnesses even if the data is going to someone who could potentially compete because you're going to lose if you don't you might lose if you do but the way in which you lose if you do at least you understand the rules and you can get ahead of the game and so you can start to figure out aha what are the moves that that other company is going to do that might potentially backfire versus, you know, how, how am I going to compete if every other clinic around is offering the wearable harness for heart patients and I'm the only one who says, bring your dog into my clinic every 15 minutes. I mean, I'm being a little bit extreme here, but <laughs> you can't win that battle. You're better off if you get ahead of it. Now, ideally, companies that are gathering data are kind of transparent about it. Uh, it's data in general for the medical industry is, is not where I think it should be, uh, but we're not going to solve that. So, and what I mean by that is I really wanted to solve data record security as part of the company because I'm passionate about it. I'm one of those weird guys who reads the legal agreements that I sign at the hospital. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I complain about them and I edit them in a lot of places and I'm not popular. But if you look at what you're signing in a human hospital, uh, you're giving away a huge amount of data rights. And in ways that are really potentially quite damaging. And there's, 
and HIPAA, you know, there's, there's a million things in the documents that say, hey, you learned about HIPAA, we're selling your data to the, uh, to the advertiser down the street, just acknowledge that it's okay. By the way, if it's not okay, no open heart surgery for you, so too bad, so sad, right? Um, so there's things that I really wanted to do in the vet space to solve this because there's some clean solutions that would give people better control over their data. But I decided that the, the veterinarians would fight back too hard because I'd have to introduce a world in which you don't fax medical records to another clinic. You send them electronically. And, uh, and I just felt that I'd, I'd, I'm, I'd be fighting the wrong battle. So I could be technically superior. I could give this amazing way to control data and, and give people really good access over it uh, but nobody would use it because it's just too radical well i i would use the radical solution so maybe maybe that will change i, I <laughs> maybe we'll see I, I appreciate it. You know, I, I'm thinking back to Amazon and lessons learned there of, of the bookseller. And I don't want to be the antiquated bookseller who fights tooth and nail against Amazon uh, to, 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 to market my books, because obviously there was a lot of really successful traditional booksellers that were able to leverage Amazon and create a very successful business on the back of that. And, mm -hmm. and so I completely appreciate that. It just gives me pause at times when I, you know, of trying to figure out and think about, is this the right company to partner with? And yep. what are, and try to think a few steps forward as to how could this potentially be leveraged against me and weigh that versus the, 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 the upside. Or if I'm given two uh, similar uh, sets of products and one is this uh, this independent uh, scrappy startup versus this very well connected uh, semi nefarious group. Uh, I'm probably going to pick the independent scrappy startup. Uh, that's fantastic, and I think I think the key thing is is the way you're thinking about it is thinking a few steps ahead. That's the important part. What's the roadmap? What happens, what, what's the plan A, B, and C? How do I hedge my bets? And also, how do I look at, you know, when you look at the veterinary space, there is, there's a set of new companies out there that are thinking differently, that are trying to make life better for people. Uh, and I can think of half a dozen of them offhand that are really, really interesting. And I'd love to see the industry start to shift to where some some of these innovative lab companies and innovative wearable companies and integrative practice management companies and integrate and, and innovative um, speech to text tra translation companies, whatever it might be, <coughs> kind of start to become more the norm because it'll be so great for the industry. Yes. And, and I totally get the, uh, you know, the traditional mindset of a practice owner, and then you get pitched this wearable and you're not sure how it, you know, how it fits, how it, it how it integrates. But when I think about it, I'm thinking about that Airbnb seven star experience. So, you know, in my perfect world, I want every, every new wellness check that comes into my practice to get, to get a, a, a wearable device for free. I want every cat that walks into my practice for a wellness exam to get, to get genomics testing for free. So then I can provide better medicine to them. I know there's an investment from me up front to be able to provide that $149 genomics test, but think of how well that translates to better medicine that I'm able to have a conversation a follow-up exam with that client saying, hey, there's these genomic markers here that, that your cat may be predisposed to, to this. You know, I want, I want that technology not to be this kind of thing in the, in the back room that, that, or it, up next to the dog food bags that's hanging, <laughs> hanging there collecting dust. I want to integrate that into that experience. And I think there's a lot of different things that can potentially do that. And when I'm thinking about practice management software, you know, that, that seamless integration of experience experience is exactly what that does, right? Of, of checking that pet in right through to that seamless window side tra uh, transaction is, is a very important part to providing a seven star customer experience. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. It's going to be a fascinating couple of years.
<laughs> Absolutely. And then, of course, we compound uh, the pandemic and all of that, uh, the intricacies of veterinary practice in a post coronavirus world. What does that what does that look like? It's got uh, my wheels turning because some vet clinics aren't necessarily designed to be able to to be agile enough to to weather that right so what does this look like in a second wave what does this look like if we're practicing nothing but curbside for the next decade i don't know I, i'm sure it won't uh, i i'm i'm a much more optimistic person than that but it it uh something like that really makes you uh do a litmus test on kind of all aspects of your business of, of how robust are we? Is there solutions available to help make this better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in the uh, software world, we have a thing called BCDR, which is business continuity and disaster recovery. And we think about that for how, what happens if we, one part of the software fails, what happens if, if uh, Amazon cloud in Virginia goes down, et cetera, et cetera. And how do you recover from those things? And it, it's a really healthy exercise to go through. And that's kind of what you just described, which is let's go through the thought process. What if I'm curbside for the next 10 years? What if, and there's some amazing things that that could lead to of rethinking, <coughs> uh, rethinking yourself. So, so for example, if you are a young veterinarian that's entrepreneurial and would like to own your clinic in a world in which curbside is how things are practiced, your real estate needs are different. They're very different. And you may start to think about, hmm, I could get a smaller space, but what I'm really looking for more is uh, parking lot design and parking lot traffic more yeah. than more than a 10,000, 20,000 square foot space with blah, blah, blah. And so as you start to think through that model, you can potentially find higher efficiencies and find other approaches that might let you come out as a, with a niche, very profitable offering. Exactly. Let me introduce you to the, uh, the, the quick loop concept, right? That, you know, that's a vet, potential vet clinic of the future. You, you should, uh, uh, there should be an entrepreneurial vet clinic. Maybe, maybe it'll be me that goes and buys a derelict quick loop that has five drive through bays mm -hmm. and you, you, you tear, you tear everything out and your vet team is, is indoors so there's a level of comfort there and you're just going car side within this really controlled environment providing great veterinary care you know, exactly. or, or or is there a is there a, a worn out old car wash in your neighborhood exactly that, that, yeah. you know that that could be a super fun and, and a really innovative way to practice medicine exactly just look up walter white i think he had a car wash available and... <laughs> But I, I think that could be absolutely great. And you think of what are the mechanisms that you think through to run an efficient car wash? Well, you care about the flow of somebody to come, you know, circulate and take care of, of the car and same type of issues that could make perfect sense to try to drive this optimal curbside experience. And somebody probably should or will do this. I think it'd be a fantastic idea. We, we should go, we should go invent that business. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> I'll start. I'll start looking for real estate. We'll do it. Perfect. Perfect. I, I think we're getting. Uh, I think we're getting kicked off our Zoom now. We uh, uh, we're, we're being told to wrap up. I see. Uh, well, that went fast. Um, yeah. It was great chatting. Yeah. No, I really appreciate it. That was fun. And uh, at least we kicked off at least one new business venture. <laughs> <laughs> As all one-hour Zoom meetings should. Indeed. Well, it was, it was a real pleasure and uh, look forward to chatting more. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate it. <laughs> Cheers.